A very warm welcome to Reflections. This is our devotional Bible study, which we're uh, presently going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Its theme is on being fulfilled as Solomon at the end of his life is reflecting on what life is truly all about. And if God is not central, things fall apart rather quickly. We'll be in chapter 6 today. If you have a Bible and like to use that to follow along, that would be wonderful. Uh, we're going to begin with that great hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. <clears throat> now thank we all our God With hearts and hands and voices Who wondrous things has done In whom his world rejoices Who from our mother's arms Has blessed us on our way With countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in and the net. All praise and thanks to God, the Father now be given, the Son and Him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was in A lot of truth in the words of that hymn. Uh, keep us in his grace, guide us when perplexed. Uh, we have much to be thankful for in life, do we not? Well, we begin in chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes. I've seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth possessions and honor, so he lacks nothing his heart desires, but God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place? All man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named. What man has been known? No man can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does the prophet, and how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in life during the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone. <clears throat> no, they, they say that the Christian life has often been compared to a race. It's more like a marathon than a sprint. You know, he said, well, who's the fastest runner in the history of the world? That would be Adam because he was first in the human race. Someone said, oh, I go running when I have to, like when the ice cream truck is doing 60. 
Kind of sounds like me for some reason. <clears throat> Milton Berle once said, my doctor told me running could add years to my life. He was right. I feel 10 years older already. Now, I came across a very unique race. It's the annual bicycle race in a town in India that has become quite a tradition. All the cyclists line up on their bicycles. The crowd gathers to cheer. And this rather interesting race, the rules are not what you expect them to be. The object is to see who can travel the shortest distance possible within a certain amount of time. All racers are disqualified if they tip over and their feet touch the ground. The crowd goes wild as the racers inch forward just enough to keep the bike balanced. Contenders who go the farthest lose, while the one who travels the shortest distance wins. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that would be hilarious to watch as a spectator, don't you? Well, you and I are not spectators in running the Christian race. And so we need grace to run well. And in chapter six, I call those running tips, grace for life's race, the marathon that we're in. So the first two verses go like this. There's an evil which I've seen under the sun, and it is widespread among mankind. A person to whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor, so his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not given him the opportunity to enjoy these things, but a foreigner enjoys them. This is a futility and severe affliction. Martin Luther said on these verses, it's describing a rich man who lacks nothing for a good and happy life and yet does not have one. The word riches, riches here refer to gold, silver, flocks, herds, houses, typical something that Solomon and his culture would have. Wealth describes a tremendous stockpile he has a tremendous accumu accumulation of all kinds of things. Honor is a word that refers to fame or splendor. And that's why uh, it refer it's interesting because it sounds awful a lot similar to the writer Solomon has. If you go all the way back to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, God said to Solomon, because you did not ask for riches, wealth, and honor, but he asked for wisdom and knowledge to rule the people over whom God made him king. God granted him wisdom and knowledge. But he also said, God said, I will give you riches, <clears throat> wealth, and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you has possessed. So in Second Chronicles and here in Ecclesiastes, these are the only passages in the Old Testament where these three words appear in the same order, riches, wealth, and honor. So what is Solomon saying? Solomon's saying, enjoy the blessings of God in the moment and thank him for all of them. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, as the hymn writer says. Don't plan to live, start living now. Be satisfied with what God gives and use it for his glory. See, many people fail to enjoy the moment due to their health situation or the circumstances in which they find themselves. <clears throat> Oftentimes, the peace of retirement is shattered by uh, one's health or a crisis in the family. It drains money and strength and joy. The person Solomon's describing here had no heir. So someone else, a stranger perhaps, could acquire the estate and enjoy, enjoy it. Then he goes on to really exaggerate some things. In verses three to six, he says things like, 
Say a person has a hundred children and lives many years and his soul is not satisfied with good things. Better a miscarriage or that that life is better off than that man. Say they live a thousand years twice but does not see good things all go to one and the same place. Solomon's saying, a person may be blessed with a large family, a long life, but be absolutely miserable. So miserable, a stillborn baby or a miscarriage baby has had a better life. Often over the years, I've heard parents say, well, why did God even permit that child to be conceived if it wasn't going to live? Solomon's saying, why did God permit wealth and a big family if they could not be enjoyed? See, it's important to understand the Jewish mind at the time, a stillborn child was not always given a name. It was felt that this would encourage the parents to get over their sorrow much faster. To have many children were marks of God's special favor, or so they thought, to a Jewish family. And Jews thought that a long life was noble. Those who were very aged thought God was especially blessing them. Now, in the early 1990s, my wife and I were expecting our second child, yet my wife had a miscarriage. So, not having experienced anything like that before, I asked the congregation to pray for us one Sunday. And what a teaching moment. People came out of the woodwork sharing their own stories of miscarriages and tales of woe, some as <clears throat> for the first time. Talk about grace for the moment, even in times of sadness and pain. The blessing of brokenness is power. And that's why God is, uh, Solomon is reminding us, God is giving us grace to enjoy all the blessings of God moment by moment by moment. Even when life is challenging, even when life is difficult. A woman had to care for her grandchild's ba baby at age 85 due to an illness. The neighbor asked the older lady if she could see the baby. This older lady said, oh, you can see it in a minute. The baby is sleeping. Well, so they enjoyed some tea and cookies. And after about three hours, the neighbor asked again. The lady said, I know you've been here for quite some time and you have showed remarkable patience. Patience. The truth is, I keep hoping the baby will wake up and start to cry so I can remember where I put it. Well, there is grace for our children and grandchildren on this side of heaven. An elderly man limped into the doctor's office. Doc, my knee hurts so bad I can hardly walk. The doctor said, sir, how old are you? And very proudly, the man said, I'm 98. The doctor said, you're almost 100 years old and you're complaining your knee hurts? The man replied, well, my other knee is 98 years old too, and it doesn't hurt. Thank God there's grace for the aging process on this side of heaven. And so we can enjoy every moment. We can enjoy the opportunity to reflect in this devotional. We can enjoy the opportunity to worship God, to pray, to read God's word, to affirm the fact that we're the loved and forgiven child, children of God, because Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead. So when we put together what Solomon is saying, he says, enjoyment without God is merely entertainment and does not satisfy. But enjoyment with God is enrichment and it brings true joy and satisfaction. Then he goes on to say in verse 9, what the eye see is better than what the soul desires. This is Solomon's version of the saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. 
I'm sure, we, sure we've all heard that saying. That Proverbs has been around for a long time. In fact, the Greek biographer Plutarch wrote in the uh, first century, he is a fool who lets slip a bird in the hand for a bird in the bush. One way of saying it, it would be a Big Mac in your mouth is better than pheasant under glass in your mind. It's better to have a little and really enjoy it than to dream about much and never attain it. So there's grace to learn the value of contentment in the Christian race. Paul told us in the book of Philippians, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. Paul told young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For what we have brought nothing in for we've brought nothing into the world, so we can take cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Not only are we blessed, oh, but we have so much, much more. Living here at the Bluffs living in the United States of America, we are blessed beyond really what we deserve, aren't we? Now, there was a study done on Olympic medalists, their attitude on the stand after receiving their medals. They discovered that the bronze medalists were much more happy than silver medalists. Silver medalists focused on how close they came to winning gold and really weren't satisfied with silver. Bronze medalists focused on how close they came not to winning anything at all. They were happy just to be on the stand. There will always be something above and beyond that we don't have or own. That's why the value of contentment is so very, very important in the life of a Christian. There were four senior golfers uh, on the golf course, one commented, oh my, the fairways seem longer than they used to. Another reminded, you know, I just can't hit the ball as far as I used to. I'm just not as strong. The third said, yeah, I, I can barely make it through nine holes. I used to be able to play 18. Well, after hearing from his buddy, the oldest and wisest of the four said, Oh, my friends, just be thankful that we're still on this side of the grass. Yes, having contentment in the aging process. There was an elderly couple who ordered one hamburger, one order of fries, and one soda with two glasses. When they got to their booth, the man placed a napkin in front of himself and his wife. He proceeded to divide the fries, cut the hamburger in half, and divide the soda equally. Well, a gentleman nearby noticed and offered to buy them another hamburger, fries, and soda. The lady commented, Oh, we've been married over 50 years, and we agreed to split everything down the middle. Well, her husband began eating, and she just sat there with her hands in her lap. Of course, the gentleman noticed why the wife wasn't eating and wondering, and she commented, I suppose you're wondering why I'm not eating. Well, she said, I told you we split everything right down the middle, and it's his day to use the teeth first. If that's not contentment, I don't know what it is. God, give us grace to learn to be content with what we have, not what we lack, not what we don't have. And then Solomon goes on to say in verse 10 and 11, whatever exists has already been named. It's known what man is, for he cannot dispute with the one who is mightier than he, or many words which increase fertility. What then is the advantage to a person? Solomon is saying now, We've got grace to live in view of God's sovereignty. Grace to be mindful that God is in control. 
See, to the Jewish mind, giving a name to something is the same thing as fixing its character. See, during creation, God uh, named the things he made, and nobody over the course of time and history has changed those designations. God is God. Humanity could never successfully dispute with God who is stronger, who's all-powerful. God is free to act as he sees fit. God truly is completely in control. Now, we may not fully understand how God exercises his lordship, his freedom, but it isn't necessary for us to know all these things. See, our greatest freedom really comes when we're lovingly lost in the will of God. What is the will of God, you say, chaplain? Well, as we read God's word, we see the word of God is the will of God. The will of God is the word of God. And as we get lost in the word of God, his will becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. And certainly the foundational aspect of his will is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So the, the bottom line of being in Christ, his ultimate will is just to get lost in love of the Savior. And as we do, we'll, we'll love those around us with the lo same love that God has for us. Now, our Father doesn't feel threatened when we question, debate, or wrestle with him. It seems like the more we discuss the subject, the less we really understand it. I saw a documentary re recently how these big orca whales eat their food with these very, very fast fish. They flap their tail. It sends kind of like a sonic boom. It stuns the fish who are faster than them, and then they gobble them up. Uh, the more we know, it seems like the less we know. There's always something out there. Now, words all, don't always bring light. Sometimes they produce clouds and even darkness. But, but this is where we need the word of God and the wisdom of God's word that he alone can give us. So he says in verse 12, who knows what is good for a person during his lifetime? We don't, but God does. Question, which is better, wealth or poverty, health or sickness, fame or uh, obscurity? Well, uh, God knows what's best for each and every one of us on this side of heaven. Not everyone becomes an Abraham Lincoln or a president of the United States. But on the other hand, God called some to be very faithful fathers and mothers, grandpa and grandpas. Not everyone's going to be famous, but God knows us by name and he uses us how he sees fit. <clears throat> There's a story of God's protection of allied prisoners during World War II, of which many were Christians. Bombers took off from the island of Guam, heading for Kakura, Japan, with a deadly cargo. Clouds covered the target area. The sleek B-29 circled for an hour until its fuel ran low. So the captain went for a secondary target. The sky was clear. Command was given for the bombs to fall. Later, an officer received startling information from military intelligence. One week before, the Japanese transferred captured Americans to that very city of Karaka, of which many were Christians. Upon reading this, the officer exclaimed, thank God for that protecting cloud. If the city hadn't been hidden from the bomber, thousands of American boys would have died. Now, ask Fanny Crosby, who was pretty much blinded from birth, yet her blindness has blessed us with great hymns. Who can tell a person what will happen to him on this side of heaven? We don't always know. 
Who knows what is good for a person? But God does. He's in control. Now, we don't always know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. God gives us enough insight and revelation to encourage us in eternity. He gives us the grace for the race to run this marathon as a child of God. He reminds us the best is coming. So enjoy every blessing God has given us in the moment. Lord, teach us to learn the value of contentment. Thank you that you're in charge and in control and there's nothing to fear or worry about on this side of heaven. Well, let's uh, close our time with uh, another of the great hymns, Count Your Blessings. <clears throat> when upon my billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, got you many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count ah, your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Are you ever burdened with the Lord of care? As the cross seems heavy, you are called to bear. Unto many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Out your blessings, name them one by one. Out your blessings, see what God hath done. Out your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Out your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. I like the last phrase of that hymn. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. This hymn writer is also saying, you know, we've got the grace of God in this race this marathon, in this Christian life, this journey in which we're in. So may today be a great blessing. May every breath be a blessing. May what we eat be a blessing. May what we do today be a blessing. May those around us be a blessing. May our families be a blessing. May the staff be a blessing. Let's count all our blessings and be grateful for what we have, not what we do not have. So may this grace continue to fill you to overflowing till we meet again.